will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a student talking to the student accommodation officer at a college. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I've just been accepted on a course at the university, and I'd like to try and arrange accommodation in the hall of residence. Yes, certainly.、Uh, please sit down. What I'll do is fill in a form with you to find out a little more about your preferences and so forth. Thank you. The student wishes to arrange accommodation in a hall of residence, so hall has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I've just been accepted on a course at the university, and I'd like to try and arrange accommodation in the hall of residence. Yes, certainly.、Uh, please sit down. What I'll do is fill in a form with you to find out a little more about your preferences and so forth. Thank you. So, first of all,、um, can I take your name? It's Anu Bhat. Could you spell your name, please? Yes, A N U B H A D B T. Thanks. And could I ask your date of birth? The thirty-first of March, nineteen seventy-two. Thank you. And where are you from? India. Oh right. And、um, what will you be studying? I'm doing a course in nursing. Right. Thank you. And how long would you want to stay in hall? Do you think? Well, it'll take three years, but I'd only like to stay in hall for two. I'd like to think about living outside for the third year. Fine. And what did you have in mind for catering? Do you want to cook for yourself or have all your meals provided? That's full board. Is there something in between? Yes, you can just have evening meal provided, which is half board. That's what I'd prefer. Yes, a lot of students、uh, opt for that. Now, with that in mind, do you have any special diet? Anything we should know about? Yes, I don't take red meat. No red meat. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now, thinking about the room itself, we have a number of options.、Uh, you can have a single study bedroom, or you can have a shared one. These are both what we call simple rooms. The other alternative is to opt for a single bedsit, which actually has more space and better facilities.
There's about twenty pounds a week difference between them. Well, actually, my grant is quite generous, and I think the bed sit sounds the best option. Lovely. I'll put you down for that, and we'll see what availability is like. Now, can I ask some other personal details which we like to have on record? Yes, of course. I wonder if you could let us know what your interests are. This might help us get a closer match for placing you in a particular hall. Um. Well, I love the theatre. Right. And I enjoy sports, particularly badminton. Ah, that's worth knowing. Now, what we finish with on the form is really a list from you of what your priorities are in choosing a hall, and we'll do our best to take these into account. Well, the first thing is I'd prefer a hall where there are other mature students, if possible. Yes, we do have halls which tend to cater for slightly older students. Ah,、mm. uh, and I'd prefer to be out of town. That's actually very good for you because we tend to have more vacancies in out of town halls.、Uh. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anything else? Well, I would like somewhere with a shared area, a, a TV room, for example, or, or something like that. It's a good way to socialise. Certainly is. That's it. Now we just need a contact telephone number for you. Oh,、uh, sure. I'll just find it.、Um, it's a、uh, double six seven five four nine. Great. So we'll be in contact with you as soon as possible. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a man giving a talk to new members of a wildlife club in the south of England. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to thirteen. Now listen carefully, and answer questions eleven to thirteen. Hello, I'm delighted to welcome you to our wildlife club, and very pleased that you're interested in the countryside and the plants and creatures of this area. I think you'll be surprised at the variety we have here, even though we're not far from London. I'll start by telling you about some of the parks and open spaces nearby. One very pleasant place is Halland Common. This has been public land for hundreds of years, and what you'll find interesting is that the River Ouse, which flows into the sea 80 kilometres away, has its source in the common. There's an information board about the plants and animals you can see here, and by the way, the common is accessible 24 hours a day. Then there's Holt Island, which is noted for its great range of trees. In the past, willows were grown here commercially for basket making, and this ancient craft has recently been reintroduced. The island is only open to the public from Friday to Sunday because it's quite small, and if there were people around every day, much of the wildlife would keep away. From there, it's just a short walk across the bridge to Longfield Country Park. Longfield has a modern replica of a farm from over two thousand years ago. Children's activities are often arranged there, like bread making and face painting. The park is only open during daylight hours, so bear that in mind if you decide to go there. Before you hear the rest of the talk. You have some time to look at questions fourteen to twenty.
Now listen and answer questions 14 to 20. Longfield Park has a programme of activities throughout the year and to give you a sample, this is what's happening in the next few days. On Monday, you can learn about herbs and how they've been used over the centuries. You'll start with a tour of our herb garden, practice the technique of using them as colour dyes for cloth and listen to an illustrated talk about their use in cooking and medicine. Then on Wednesday, you can join local experts to discover the variety of insects and birds that appear in the evening. We keep to a small number of people in the group, so if you want to go, you'll need to phone the park ranger a few days ahead. There's a small charge which you should pay when you turn up. I'm sure you're all keen to help with the practical task of looking after the park, so on Saturday you can join a working party. You'll have a choice of all sorts of activities, from planting hedges to picking up litter so you'll be able to change from one to another when you feel like it. The rangers will be hard at work all day, but do come and join in, even for just a short while. One thing, though, is to make sure you're wearing something that you don't mind getting dirty or torn. And finally, I'd like to tell you about our new wildlife area, Hinchingbrook Park, which will be opened to the public next month. This slide doesn't really indicate how big it is, but anyway, you can see the two gates into the park and the main paths. As you can see, there's a lake in the northwest of the park with a bird hide to the west of it at the end of a path. So it'll be a nice, quiet place for watching the birds on the lake. Fairly close to where refreshments are available, there's a dog walking area in the southern part of the park, leading off from the path. And if you just want to sit and relax, you can go to the flower garden. That's the circular area on the map, surrounded by paths. And finally, there's a wooded area in the western section of the park, between two paths. OK, that's enough from me, so let's get on and have a look. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a geography student called Caroline discussing her dissertation with her tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Ah, Caroline. Come on in, sit down. Thanks. So how's the dissertation planning going? Well, Dr. Shulman, I'm still having a lot of trouble deciding on a title. Well, that's perfectly normal at this stage. And this is what your tutorials will help you to do. Right. What we'll do is jot down some points that might help you in your decision. First of all, you have chosen your general topic area, haven't you? Yes, it's the fishing industry. Oh yes, that was one of the areas you mentioned. Now, what aspects of the course are you good at? Well, I think I'm coping well with statistics, and I'm never bored by it. Good. Anything else? Well... I found computer modelling fascinating. Mm -hmm. I have no problem following what's being taught, whereas quite a few of my classmates find it difficult. Well, that's very good. Do you think these might be areas you could bring into your dissertation? Oh, yes, if possible. 
It's just that I'm having difficulty thinking how I can do that. You see, I feel I don't have sufficient background information. I see. Well, do you take notes? <sighs> I'm very weak at note taking. Mm -hmm. My teachers always used to say that. Well, I think you really need to work on these weaknesses before you go any further. What do you suggest? Before you hear the rest of the tutorial, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. Well, I can go through the possible strategies with you and let you decide where to go from there. OK, thanks. Well, some people find it helpful to organize peer group discussions. You know, each week a different person studies a different topic and shares it with the group. Oh. Oh, right. It really helps build confidence. Yeah. You know, having to present something to others. I can see that. The drawback is that everyone in the group seems to share the same ideas. They keep being repeated in all the dissertations. Okay. You could also try a service called Student Support. Mm -hmm. It's designed to give you a structured program over a number of weeks to develop your skills. Sounds good. Yes. Unfortunately, there are only a few places. Ah. But it's worth looking into. Yes, of course. I know I've got to work on my study skills. And then there are several study skills books you can consult. Right. They'll be a good source of reference. But the problem is, uh, they are sometimes too general. Yes, that's what I've found. Other than that, uh, I would strongly advise quite simple ideas... Uh, like using a card index. Well, yes, I've never done that before. Uh, it's simple, but it really works because you have to get points down in a small space. Hmm. Another thing I always advise is don't just take your notes and forget about them. Read everything three times. That'll really fix them in your mind. Yes. I can see it would take discipline, but... Well, if you establish good study skills at this stage, they'll be with you all your life. Oh, yes, I completely agree. Mm. It's just that I don't seem to be able to discipline myself. I need to talk things over. Mm, well, uh, we'll be continuing these tutorials, of course. Uh, let's arrange next month's now. Let's see. Um, I can see you virtually any time during the week starting uh, the 22nd of January. Um, what about the 24th? I'm mm. free in the afternoon. Uh, sorry, I'm booked then. Mm. Uh, what about the following day? Uh, the Thursday? Yeah. I can make the morning. Fine. We'll go for the 25th then. That's great. Thanks. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear the beginning of a lecture about business cultures. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. Now, whether you're going to university to study business or some other subject, many of you will eventually end up working for a company of some kind. Now, when you first start working somewhere, you will realize that the organization you've joined has certain characteristics. And we often refer to these social characteristics as the culture of the organization. This includes its unwritten ideas, beliefs, values, and things like that. One well-known writer has classified company cultures by identifying four major types. The first type is called the power culture, and it's usually found in small organizations. It's the type of culture that needs a central source of power to be effective, and because control is in the hands of just one or two people, there aren't many rules or procedures. Another characteristic is that communication usually takes the form of conversations rather than, say, formal meetings or written memos. Now, one of the benefits of this culture is that the organization has the ability to act quickly, so it responds well to threat or danger on the one hand and opportunity on the other. But on the negative side, this type of organization doesn't always act effectively because it depends too much on one or two people at the top. And when these people make poor decisions, there's no one else who can influence them. And the kind of person who does well in this type of business culture is one who is happy to take risks and for whom job security is a low priority. The next type is known as role culture. That's R-O-L-E, not R-O-L-L, -L, by the way. And this type is usually found in large companies, which have lots of different levels in them. These organizations usually have separate departments that specialize in things like finance or sales or maintenance or whatever. Each one is coordinated at the top by a small group of senior managers and typically everyone's job is controlled by sets of rules and procedures. For example, there are specific job descriptions, rules for discipline, and so on. What are the benefits of this kind of culture? Well, firstly, because it's found in large organizations, its fixed costs, or overheads as they're known, are low in relation to its output or what it produces, in other words, it can achieve economies of scale. And secondly, it is particularly successful in business markets where technical expertise is important. On the other hand, this culture is often very slow to recognize the need for change, and even slower to react. What kind of person does this type of culture suit? Well, it suits employees who value security and who don't particularly want to have responsibility. Moving on now to task cultures. This type is found in organizations that are project-oriented. You usually find it where the market for the company's product is extremely competitive, or where the products themselves have a short lifespan. Usually, top management delegates the projects, the people, and other resources. And once these have been allocated, little day-to-day -day control is exercised from the top, because this would seem like breaking the rules. Now, one of the major benefits of this culture is that it's flexible. But it does have some major disadvantages, too. For instance, it can't produce economies of scale or great depth of expertise. People who like working in groups or teams prefer this type of culture. And finally, the fourth category is called the person culture. This type is quite unusual. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
That is the end of the listening test. <laughs>